All right, what's up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here. Thank you so much for tuning to GSD Interviews. Before we jump into this interview, I want to give our sponsors a quick plug that make this show possible. So our first sponsor is our real estate software, www.perfectstormnow.com, the most affordable and effective lead generation software out there. This isn't just a website. Yeah, we've got a website. Yeah, we've got a blog feature. Yeah, we have a, a testimonials and, and video client testimonials feature. We have community pages. We have all of, of the typical website stuff. Where we differentiate ourselves is on the lead generation. We teach you how to lead generate. This, this system is extremely effective with lead generation. We can teach you how to go out there and generate more leads than you can handle um, without spending a, a penny on lead generation, right? Um, not only, though, do we teach you how to lead generate, not only is it a great website, um, it's it's a coaching platform combined with with software. So we have two, uh, uh, two monthly live training sessions that are two hours long um, with myself personally. So we teach you how to use the site, how to generate with the site, how to leverage the site. And, and it goes deeper than that. Okay, I'm getting all these leads. What do I do? What do I say? How do I convert these leads? So we go and train you and coach you on every aspect of that. So you can go out there and dominate it in your business. You have access to me, my developers on a daily basis as a customer of ours. So it's 99 bucks a month, um, no contracts, no uh, registration fees. It's month to month, 99 bucks a month. You can't beat it, right? So go check us out, www.perfectstormnow.com. Our next sponsor is My Personal Mentorship. You know, if you're ready to take your business, your life, your career to the next level, uh, we've got my 90 day ba- uh, mastery boot camp, which is a, a mentorship with me personally. Every single week, it's three hours or two hours of live coaching and training with me, and then one hour of live Q and A. You have daily access to me and our private mastermind. Um, we build out your playbook, every every aspect of the residential real estate business, from from how to lead generate to how to lead follow up to how to do your presentations to how to build out your database. Um, we even start talking about how to grow a team, how to hire how to fire. There's nothing that we do not cover inside that program. Then after the program's done, after the initial 12-week program's done, um, it's an ongoing platform. It's 50 bucks a month uh, where you have access to me for as long as you want. You know, right? And in that $50 a month program, you guys, I've made that where $50 a month is more powerful than a $1,000 a month coaching program that you can get anywhere else. So we do um, <coughs> four hours of, of monthly coaching, at 50 bucks a month. So you get four hours of, of live coaching. Uh, we have two in-person masterminds here in Phoenix, Arizona. They're every six months. It's a private mastermind with uh, me and only the alumni bootcamp members that are part of the mem- uh, mentorship. We don't bring in guest speakers. There's nothing to sell. There's none of that crap that we all get at all of these other uh, seminars that we go to. You usually go pay 500 bucks for a seminar and they try to sell you a bunch of shit. That's not what this is. This is hardcore masterminding. This is a hardcore mentorship masterminding growth program. Uh, so if you guys want to learn more about that, www.90daymastery.com. Hope to see you guys in the program. All right, let's jump on into the interview. Hopefully you enjoy this as much as I did. What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD interview. Where every single week, we interview top entrepreneurs and just straight up top badasses, you guys, that are out there dominating their space, that are choosing to go out there and create an epic life and not accepting mediocrity. So today, you guys, I got an amazing guy on the show. This is a guy that uh, uh, has taken a company from doing $1 million a year over $28 million a year in, in, in production and just a dude that's doing some awesome, awesome things. I'm really excited, stoked, and honored to have Mike Aguilar on the show. Welcome to the show, my friend. Hey man, excited to be here. Yeah, dude, this is awesome, man. So, um, you know, we watch a lot of YouTube videos and a lot of systems training that you do, and I'm like, man, I got this uber successful dude. He's got he's got tattoos. I got to have this guy on the show, right? So, um, so I appreciate you being here. That's it. <laughs> so I appreciate you being here, man. Uh, before we get into what you're doing, Dick, because I know you're doing a lot of big things today. I mean, let's rewind the clock, dude. Like, how, how did you get into entrepreneurship in the first place? Like, where did the journey begin? Yeah, so I think the journey begins a uh, long time ago when I'm 15 years old. I'm on my own, survivor of just a brutal divorce with uh, with my parents, and I end up in an apartment. Me and my brother, he's 17 years old. He just got his license, and my dad's like, I'll just set you guys up and just kind of survive, and he, he got his own new wife, and you know, it was just like, you guys are men, you'll survive young, and what that taught me was, one, I had to figure this this stuff out really fast. So as I started to work for people, because I just, I think what's important for a lot of people to know is like, I don't have no college degree or anything. Really, my degree is the degree of having to figure this out. 
to survive and to get better. So, I mean, I've worked for some employees, but at the age of 22, I said, you know what? Most of the people, and probably like a lot of entrepreneurs who you're working with, they seem like idiots, right? They're just like, you think they're doing it all wrong and you could do it so much better. But here's, here's what I figured out. I went and became this entrepreneur thinking I knew it, but I really didn't know, right? I didn't know. So I always tell people, like, I did it wrong for 10 years. The last word I would tell you about um, what made me forced to become an entrepreneur is I'm with my wife. I call her my goddess for 30 years is that I knew that as I was going to start growing a business, you know, I needed to figure out how was I going to serve my children at the highest possible level so that they could have this different quality of life. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep, no, I love it, man. So those early years, you know, because so many people talk about their successes and, and, it, and then it's tough because then we see these uber successful people like you and, you know, we, we think that maybe you're different than the, the entrepreneur struggling, right? But you've had to go through those struggles. So what were some of those, you know, you're like, hey, man, I, I failed. I made a lot of mistakes that first 10 years. What were some of those biggest learning moments, those biggest obstacles that you had to overcome? Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, here, here's the thing. A lot of people probably... They're going to say, I heard stuff like this before, and, and, and maybe you'll hear it different this time. And I believe it's, it is a, it's a mindset game, right? The, the biggest struggle, the biggest roadblock was my own personal limiting beliefs. Do I deserve this success? Oh, you're on your own since you're 15. You went to a vocational school where I was probably the only person in the vocational school that didn't do drugs, right? I mean, this is a school with leather jackets back in the day, combat boots on, and, and you had to kind of fight to survive. You had no friends in the school. I mean, this is like if you didn't go to the traditional high school and college, what they did was they took all the people that they thought were confused from divorced families and they shoved them into vocational schools, right? So, you know, I, I think the thing when you think about, and it's what holds us back. I mean, what keeps, what keeps you or me from owning a hundred million, 200 million or, or a billion dollar business today? Well, it's probably not skill sets. It's the level of mindset, the level of our thinking. What is the roadblock? Maybe we, we think we deserve millions, but we don't deserve a hundred million. And it sounds easy, but what most people don't know is that, you know, these limiting beliefs are deep, man. They're in your subconscious mind. And I don't want to get all like foo foo y and stuff on everybody, but it's in your mind. It's programmed from a, a kid. Like I remember my dad telling me, he's like, you know, Mike, Money doesn't grow on trees. That normally came with no one shuts the damn lights off, right? Yep. And and later I told my dad, you know, as I started to really become successful, because success once I made up my mind started to come really, really uh, quick. I said, you know, what if you owned apple tree, orange tree, lemon trees? Well, I could pick that stuff off and sell it for money. So money does grow on trees. And really that example was helping me reframe that money is abundance. And for some people listening to this, they're like, you know, Mike, F off, like, you know, my life's difficult, right? And, and, and for some of them, they're going, yeah, I get it. But what I want you to get is it's not a mindset game like, oh, my, my mind's good, I'm positive. Because you're always at the next mindset game. Last thing I'll tell you is that it's not even just mindset. It's mindset capacity. You can have a great mindset. And, but you're at your level of mindset capacity. And until you look at it and you say, how do I expand my mindset capacity? You will only grow to that, that limits. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. That internal self-belief system. Absolutely. Yeah. I love it. So, you know, so, so you, you get that shift, you, you know, you kind of raise your internal self-belief system and you make up your mind that, that you're going to go out there and do this big and, and you shift that. Then that's got to be followed by new disciplines, right? You know, what were some of those new disciplines and new behaviors that you had to then adopt that took yeah. you to that next level? Okay. So first off, I'm a pretty disciplined guy because I'm doing martial arts for 31 years. So from 14 years old to today being 45 years old, I've been doing martial arts and never stopped. So I've always been a very disciplined, just my discipline normally was very combat, hate the world discipline. And, and now I'm probably more strategic, uh, disciplined on it. I would say the things that, that really started, um, to, and, and, and re ask me the question again, because I want to make sure I really narrow down for what they really need to hear from this. Yeah, so, so you made up that, that mind. You, know, you, you, you got yep. your mindset right. Um, then it had to be followed by certain disciplines to yeah. take you to that next level. So you know, what were some of those new disciplines that you added that okay. um, took you to that next level? Got it. I'm going I'm to give you the biggest thing I had to learn. Okay, so first I'm going to grow this business. I'm going to be an entrepreneur, right? So I'm like, well, I got to consume everything. 
give me, give me all the books. Give me, you know, Think and Grow Rich and E-Myth and all this stuff that people are throwing out there, right? Give it to me. Give it to me. And I'm a consumption monster, but I'm consuming, which the schools taught me to do, the traditional industrial schools, which is probably a subject we don't want to get in because I homeschool my children because I believe that's where the entrepreneur is getting killed today. But we're consuming, but we're not expanding. You're reading, but you're, you're not growing. And the last thing is when you, if you can, what I changed was not just consume. I consumed information. I asked myself, what did I just learn? How did I expand? And then I executed on it. Let me give you an example. Most people, they come to me, they're like, I read Blue Ocean Strategy and all this stuff. And I'm like, great. What'd you learn? And they're like, you know, it's a deer in a headlock. like, no one's asked me that. And I'm like, okay, well, what'd you do with it? And I'm like, wait, you think a badge of honor is I read a thousand books a day? That's only a badge of honor if I read a thousand books and I have millions of dollars of success. Now it's a badge of honor. Otherwise, you consumed without expansion and, and execution on the expansion, which I would give everybody a tip. And I was given this tip by a really smart guy, Cameron, uh, Cameron Harold. He wrote a book, Double Double, and he helped grow 1-800-GOT-JUMP. Real smart guy. And I did mentoring with him years and years ago. And I'm like, what should I read? What should I read? Right? And he's like, well, what do you, what's the problem you're dealing with? And I'm like, well, I'm dealing with a culture problem. And he's like, read a book on culture. And I was like, well, wait, that sounded too simple, right? But, but a lot of us are not doing that. The last thing I would tell you is anybody who's consuming information, the way you want to consume information is the same way that if you're helping somebody, like I want to consume it until revelation, until I learn something, I'm like, got it. And then I shut the book. So if I have a book I'm reading, I'm like, that was good. Don't highlight and keep moving on. Stop, apply, then go back to the book tomorrow, later today, revelation again, apply. Make sense? Yep. Yeah. And, and it's true. I mean, everybody's getting through the book, not trying to really get from it. You know, and you hear the, you hear the stats of, Oh, your average CEO reads 60 books a year. So you, yeah, you kind of feel that pressure. Like, dude, I just got to crank through these. And I've been right. there too, you know, people bring up a book. I'm like, oh, I've read that. And I start reflecting. I'm like, dude, I don't remember one damn thing of it. You know, so I, I, I love that, man. So um, with your implementation, man, um, you know, because I know you're an implementation machine. Um, do, do you have any kind of tips and tricks on implementation? Because you get the whole paralysis through analysis. Holy crap, I got these hundred things I need to implement. And I, you know, do you have any kind of tips and tricks there that you do? I do. So, so I'm probably is not as much of an implementer as a delegator. And I normally would like to say that I'm lazy, but I'm not lazy at all. I just always look at this, right? Implementation is all about what needs to get done and then what's the fastest way to get it done. And then I always ask the last question without me doing any of it. Because today, look, I, people hate when I, I say this, right? Today is the easiest time in the world to build a big ass business. I don't care what it is because a one-man business on the internet can make himself look like he's a Fortune 500 company. No other time in the world have you been able to, to do something like this. So when you think about the delegation, I learned, and there's so many things, right? Like, um, and there's a guy out there, Ari, who wrote this book, uh, Less Doing, More Living. And, and he talks about, you know, first you got to optimize. And I think this goes into the subject you're talking about. First, optimize what the hell am, am I doing, Right. Second, can I automate it? Because here's the problem. Until you can automate it, you know, there's so many things that we can get doing without us, with simple apps and systems, without going crazy on this stuff, right? And, and, and the last thing is outsource it. And today, when you think about um, delegating, getting these things done, I mean, you get people in the world, you could pay them two, three, five bucks an hour. They love you for it. It's not abuse. They're living like in the top, level in their place and they're like oh my god thank you the whole thing is you have to understand the skill set and just be ready to okay who can do it and how can they do this over and over this is why right now i have 170 employees that work for me in my service company in new jersey okay we did 180 million in that in the last 10 years alone consumed okay i decided to do a coaching business two and a half years ago we're already going to do three and a half um million in that this year. And I don't say that to brag or like, ha ha, Mike, you're so amazing. I say that because I want to get the point. What I learned in the coaching business to build it was I built a team, I outsourced it and it grows. Things grow so much faster. Yep. So, so when you're, when you're doing that and when you're automating this stuff, it really 
boils down to the systems that you have in place. And, you know, I mean, right. that's where I discovered you. I'm, I'm doing some systems training, looking at systems. I come across your YouTube video and, 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 you know, you're starting to lay out how to go out there and develop those systems. And that's yeah. where so many people lack. Um, you know, how, how important to you are systems? Um, and, and, you know, what would, what would an entrepreneur that maybe their systems suck, you know, where would yeah. they get started? Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So, so here's where most people get started and it's the most read book, the most misunderstand book and the most unutilized book on the planet. You probably know where I'm going. It's the E-Myth, right? Like everyone's like, oh, get the E-Myth. And I'm like, what'd you do? Well, why the hell are you asking me a system problem? You got the E-Myth, right? It's because it's not that easy to process. See, first off, there's a difference between a system and a process. And, and you have to understand these two fundamental differences in order to implement this. And I'm going to give you how to do something like today so fast. But the process is something that has many layers, many people, and it has start and finish points along along the way, okay? I give people an example like um, maybe in the real estate world, there is a lead process where the lead has to come in and then paperwork is done and maybe it goes into a Salesforce software and then if the deal is closed and then there's a short. This is a process with many people, many lanes, and it lets everybody know what is the flow of things. But see, those are a lot of times you got to build them with sticky notes and mind map, and it's it, that's not the lowest hanging fruit. They're needed, but it's not the lowest hanging fruit. Here's the lowest hanging fruit, a simple system. The way I explain the system is, one, just decide on what is one of your number one thorns, the thing you're dealing with, the thing you're telling everybody like, God, just remember to do this. Can you just remember this? I'll give you a simple example everybody can relate. So at the end of the night in my, my business in New Jersey, we have one building that's 15,000 square foot. I have another building that's 10,000 square foot. Well, it's like, look, how many times am I going to take a ride by here at nighttime and the doors are unlocked to one of our trucks? We have 145 trucks. The doors are unlocked. Okay, how do we solve it? I know it's a problem. It keeps happening. I'll build a simple system. Look, last person in the building, what do you got to do? Shut off the lights, turn on the alarm, make sure the building doors are locked. Check the doors are locked. Simple. Takes me 15 minutes to get that done. Now, first, you have to be able to identify the problem. What is the problem that keeps coming up that I never want to happen again? Number two, I'll tell you the fastest way to build this. Especially today, technology, it's amazing. So if I, if I hear of a problem, I'm like this. Okay, I'm driving home. It takes me 15 minutes. I grab my phone. I'm like, Siri, send me an email. Subject line. F'd up problem. Now, I don't know your thing, so I'll use F. I'm a big cursor, but I won't use it on your show because I don't know hey, if that's it's, true. It's get shit done show, man. So all right, all right, all right. <laughs> so I'm an old school fucking Italian, so I just need to make sure uh, uh, where I'm at. I tell people, you know, you, you don't have to love me to get value uh, from it, right? So on the way home, I'm like, Siri, subject line, fix the fucking problem. Okay, and then I'm like, Siri, here's the deal. Make sure the guy locks the door. Da-da-da. Now, Siri has typed this thing out and emailed it to me. I go back. I say, okay, real quick, I adjust it, I have a cap on it. This is who it applies, this is where it is. Now, let me tell you the biggest problem with systems today. I don't even think it's building the system. I think it's how do you keep it alive? That's where the breakdown is. A lot of people put these simple system, lock the door, lock the trucks, you can apply that any way you want, but they don't go back and check it. So the big thing about a system is, one, put it inside a book, Two, you know when you go in the bathroom, well, if it's a good bathroom, they have the checkoff sheet on the door like we cleaned it, right? We, we cleaned the toilets and stuff. Well, you have that book and you assign it to either one person or if it's you, once a month, you just go in the book and you're like, system, spot check, good, check, I'm done. System, spot check, bad, re-implement, send it to everybody. Now, here's the coolest thing that I think that's um, awesome about this world. I'm a big video guy. Like you're a video guy too. The thing about video is you should never have to ever repeat a conversation again because the minute the system's broke, I'm like, let me do a video. Hey, let me explain to you the system. I'm not sure of the breakdown, but here's what we need to do. Here's the sheet. I need you to email me back confirming you have clarity and understanding around this system. And to have, if in order to have accountability, which I think is important, I'll let you open up another question. In order to have accountability, you have to have two things, which I think plays a part in systems. You got to have clarity, clearness. What do I need done? You have to have alignment. Who is this talking to? And the only way you can have accountability is with clarity and alignment. Yeah. So you talk about inspecting what you expect there. And and, so many people are like, man, I don't want 
this big company because I don't want to manage people. Well, if you have, if you're able to manage the systems that manage the people, you don't have to manage the people, you know, right? So, but then yeah. what happens? Like, okay, when you're inspecting the system, and then let's say that person's not doing what they're doing. I mean, how do you do that? Because it that's the hardest part is getting your people to do the work. Yeah. So, so I'm going to give you a couple pieces. One, it's funny. Um, there's probably a limiting belief first that has to be tackled there. When people tell me, <coughs> excuse me, people tell me they're like. You know, Mike, money is not everything. I say that's very well said from a broke-ass guy, right? And then they tell me, you know, I don't want a big company. I said, of course you don't because you don't believe you could even build a big company. The thing that people want to take from this right now before I talk about how do you create this ultimate alignment with systems and when they break rules and all this other shit is, one, my service company that will do $32 million this year, it runs without me the last three and a half years. If you come here, there's no square desk. There's no square office I sit in with my square ass on the square seat. It's not there. So one, I would tell people, stop shutting down big companies or big problems. That's a belief system that people tried to give you, and it's only true if you take it on. Now, number two, we built in what we call the four steps of discipline. This thing revolutionized accountability in my company. Okay, step number one, which most people have, but they forget a key part. It's verbal, right? Hey, dude, you didn't do this. Don't do it again. It's verbal. But what I learned is verbal, you forget how many verbals you get. You keep telling people, fix it, fix it, fix it. So it's verbal documented. All that means, and this has to go, and this is going to apply to anybody with employees, anybody who's going to have employees, anybody who has vendors. So pay attention to this process. One, verbal documented. All it means is I'm going to put it in your folder. When it comes time and you're asking me for more money, more incentive program, whatever it is, I'm going to open up your folder. I'll see you make mistakes once, but you haven't made it again. We're cool. Step number two, we're going to write it up. Me and you're going to have a conversation. We're going to document it. You're going to sign it. It's going to go in your DNA. You're going to tell me you do, you do problems twice. Okay. When I open up your folder and I repeat this every time, when I open up your folder, you're looking for more money, more incentive programs. I'm going to see you make mistakes twice. That's going to suck. But as long as we don't keep coming, making the same mistake, we're good. Number three, take a week vacation, unpaid, you don't get anything, hang out with your wife and kids, reflect on things. Why do you keep making the same mistake over and over? Now, this is a very healthy boundary tool, and I've taught it to all 170 employees because I want clarity and alignment so I have accountability. So strike number three, you go home. Everybody answers strike number four. I'm like, look, if you make the same mistake four times in a row, what should happen the last time? And they always answer it. I should be fired. I should be terminated. You're right. When you come back from your week vacation, we're going to have a discussion. Are you still a fit here? Because I believe, like, if everybody in the military was just making all kinds of mistakes or everybody in the police force or in the hospital, like, people would be dying all over the place. So it shouldn't be acceptable in any business anywhere. And we call this the four steps of discipline. It may sound simple. I challenge anybody listening, even if you have steps of this, how well are you doing it right now? Because business owners are like, well, um, I don't want to, I don't want to, like, ruffle his feathers. What if he leaves? I'm like, geez, what if he keeps making mistakes and he stays? What's that going to look like? Yep. Make sense? Yep. I love that, man. So how many is the CEO, you know, the owner of the business? I mean, how, how what, what's a healthy amount of time to be spending on these systems? I mean, is it, I mean, are you still spending to this day, you know, an hour a day or an hour a week overlooking those systems? Yeah. So I, I think it applies to, are you a one man company, five man company, 10 man company, or a hundred, whatever it is. So today I can't, I personally haven't built a system in, in years now because my team, when I have a meeting with them, which I have two directors that I work directly with, and I'll say to them, okay, what's the best thing going on? What's the worst thing uh, going on right now, right? And they'll say the best thing's this, and I'm like, cool, that's working good. What's the worst thing? Awesome. A worst thing happens because of a system or process failure breakdown. I'll identify what it is, go build it, implement it. That's it. Now, if you're a one-man person, here's the thing you have to do. You have to be a good explorer. You have to be good at identifying what is causing me the pain, and that's it. Just build it. So I think if you're a one-man company new, I think, and, and if you can get to the habit that you build one system a week, build it on Monday, implement it on Thursday, just do one a week, simple things, shut off the lights, make sure the paperwork's good you know, follow up on leads, whatever it is, at the end of the week, you have what? 52 systems. And I think there's a bigger thing about systems why not only does it help a company run itself, 
Okay, it helps structure. It creates high levels of accountability and profit profitability, right? But I think the biggest thing is if you're ever looking at your uh, business as a sellable asset of any kind, a business with systems in it is worth a hundred times more than a business that you're the only system. Yep, love it, man. So you know, you, you built this amazing company and you got to the point where where it doesn't need you to operate it and run it. Um, then how did you transition into coaching, man? Like what what led to to that uh, journey? Okay, so three and a half years ago, um, three and a half years ago, I made a conscious decision. I wanted, I'm always about bucking the trend, breaking the rules, right? Shatter the beliefs. And, and I shattered the beliefs by growing a big company because first off, right, when people see the tattooed brothers of the world, I always tell them when I'm on stage talking to five, 600 people, I'm like, look, my wife says you're a purple unicorn. Like we're pretty sure it exi exists. We just never fucking seen one, right? And so I'm a trend bucker. So one trend was I wanted to grow a big business really fast and show it's possible. The second thing was, how do I do this? You know, what's the next trend? And the next trend for me was, can I have a big business and get it to run itself? So that was the, the next thing to do. And I proved it. I proved it fast. Once I put laser focus on it, it, it started to run itself. And you know what I did? Number one thing I tell people to do, don't have an office. The day we gave up our office, I mean, I have a damn backpack and a laptop and a white pad, right? That does, you know, going to do 30 something million just there. Now I'm going to lead to the coaching side. I believe that first off retirement's death. And I believe too much free time can kill an entrepreneur's mind because, and I'll tell you why entrepreneurs, I used to thought I had a disease because I'm flipping the steak and I'm trying to think of a better way to flip the steak, right? So I used to tell, hang out with my entrepreneur friends and tell them, like, I think I got a disease because, like, even cooking the steak, I'm trying to think of a better way to make the steak, right? And they said, well, no, that's just, that's our way, right? So I knew that I had to do something that was going to keep me in the game in something that I was passionate about. And through some real soul searching, I came across and said, you know what? If I can change the world in a bigger way and make a bigger impact, it's about changing one person at a time. And that's what led me. This company's running itself. And also, I think what's really smart for me, which I think any listeners out there, is my coaching company is really easy because, one, I leverage my employees on one side to help do work on the other side. So my coaches in my coaching company run my service company. And when you teach, you become better. So that's really cool. I get to leverage my same facility for it. And I get to serve people. So that's why we're working with 72 companies, Australia, Canada, all over the United States right now. So it's really about me making sure, and I, any entrepreneurs out there, you have to make sure you have something next, but don't be a shiny object person because my partner is a little shiny object. He's like, hey, someone's selling a pizza place. We should buy it. I'm like, oh my God, like what? The pizza guy's going to call out and like, because we're Italian, I'm going to be putting sauce on and stuff. I'm like, no, like that's shiny object shit. So don't get caught in that trap, right? Yep. Love it, man. So um, what we find that good becomes the worst enemy of greatness. You know, it's so easy to get to a point in life where it's like, okay, you know, things are good enough. I mean, you're, you're at a point right now where you could easily just coast, dude, and, and, and you know, be done and, and your family's taken care of. You know, what, what keeps you growing every day, not settling for good enough and keep chasing greatness? Yeah. So, so there's a couple things. One, I will tell you along the lines of what you're saying, success is a curse and a gift because success breeds complacency and complacency is death for anybody. So the question is what, what keeps me driven is this one. Um, I'm always looking what's going to be my, my passion, my purpose and, and kind of my power to keep me going. And, and I want to make sure that I can leave not only wealth, because I think wealth is good, but wealth of information that will change the next 10 generations of my lineage, I guess you would say. My son's sons, my daughter's sons. My, my son is uh, 16, but he's 16, six foot tall, 280 pounds with full grown beard. So he's a big man. He's bigger than me twice the size. He hugged me. He's like, come here, dad. Right. My daughter's 14 with purple hair and an artist. And, and the cool thing is, um, what, what people on this don't know is I'm, I, I've been a tattoo artist for 18 years. Most people, I, I don't even really share that publicly, but I've been in kind of hibernation for two or three years, but now I'm kicking it back up. I'm going to tattoo a big ass piece on my, my son soon. Cause he's, he's re he's manhood. He's, he's ready for that. So one is don't let success be a curse. And the other thing is understand your passion. If you don't have it, 
you got to go for it because your passion will keep you driven. And when you have a big purpose, the other thing is I want to know that I've made an impact in the world. Last year alone, I didn't collect money. This is personal money for me and my business partner. We gave over $100,000 between Make-A-Wish Foundation, uh, Wounded Warriors, and Cookies for a Cure, these unfortunate kids with cancer. So I always tell people like, um, look, when wealth becomes a larger purpose than just serve yourself, you will then abundantly get it 10, 10 times more. Yep. I love it, man. So, you know, it's said out there that we are the result of five people that we spend most time, the most time with, right? Um, you know, you hang out with five losers, you're, you're the sixth loser. Um, and, and I get asked this question all the time on the podcast of, hey, man, I'm ready to kind of start leveling up with, with the people I'm surrounding with. You know, I, I want to start hanging out with millionaires, but man, they're busy. I can't just pick up the phone and get them... <coughs> to hang out with me. I mean, how important do you think that is and how do you reach up uh, uh, to make those contacts so you get in better circles? Yeah, so so I think there's a couple ways. Um, I'll give you the old school in the hood way, okay? Um, I was very lonely probably, uh, maybe it's 10, 10 years ago, really lonely because, you know, you go to family dinner and you're the black sheep, right? They don't get it. You're talking about business. They're like, shut the hell up, right? Like, you, you know, they want to talk about their problems, their aches and, and pains and stuff. So what I did was I actually went to meet up, uh, the meetup site and I was like, look, entrepreneurs, business marketers. And I found a meetup group of business owners and I went there and I'll tell you that everybody, there was 10, I think 10 people there. Um, nine of them were idiots. I just tell you, I couldn't even, I, w I couldn't even blend them. One guy wanted to make like 50 more cents an hour. Another guy was just his own worst enemy. Right. And, but the one guy who put it on, I met and he, Samir is his name, Kumar. He's still one of my very best friends. So that's the simplest way where you can go out to these free sites. Now, since then I've been in some of the top groups on the planet, right? I mean, I, I, I'm in groups with guys like, you know, Joe Polish and, and Cameron Harold and, uh, you know, D Dan Sullivan from strategic coach. And so if you can't afford to get in the circles of the empires of these big guys, well, just, just move up one layer up, find business owners that are motivated, that are just a layer above you. Someone else asked me, I mean, there's an organization EO out there, which is a great organization, but then I was in it for a little bit, but I have to be around, not just entrepreneurs that are wealthy. I need about guys like you that are so hungry. It's like, we are alive, right? And so many people are like, oh, I'm successful and they're dead. That's why I tell people, I'm like, the people that don't watch The Walking Dead, um, you're watching it every day. Just look at society. They're all the walking dead, right? People just don't put it in, in perspective. So just move up the level. The other thing is I think getting around guys like you, people who come around me is because sometimes it's, I want to get to one person. So like, I want to come and see you so that you can teach me all the stuff you learned from all the smarts. I don't need to be around 20 amazing people. I need to be around one amazing person like you. And you tell me, let me tell you what I learned from the 20 amazing people. And I tell people, you know, I've spent, and there's no smoke, no bullshit here. I spent over $600,000 the last 11 years. Now I don't say that like that was bad. That changed my life because I believe, you know, so many people today, they're like, um, oh, I can't afford coaching in this. Really? I'm like, well, well, you bought a Lincoln Navigator. What returns that <laughs> thing going to give you? And you're in debt to bitch and it's $80,000. Well, you won't spend what? 10, 15, $20,000 on the number one thing. The number one thing that supports your family, your wealth, your life, buy you more cars, more vacation homes. And you can't afford that. Right. So I would say I gave you a couple different layers where you can go out there and, and really be able to socialize. And I love going to different events and stuff because when I'm around other entrepreneurial craziness, right? It just, it drives me. And also I'm, I'm a giver. That's why I'm on this. Like I don't expect nothing in return. I'm not here. I have nothing to pitch anybody. Like I'm here because if this serves one person, boom, we're, we're good. Life's great. Yeah, no, I love that, man. So do you have a, uh, whether it's like a daily or a weekly routine where, where you're able to reflect and, and, and keep an eye on your goals and just, you know, to make a gauge to see how you're doing and um, yeah. paying attention to that? It's funny. I was talking to one of my clients this morning. He was dealing with something, and I said one of the one of the biggest ways to grow and expand is is uh, self awareness and self coaching, 
right? So if you look at my daily routine, and I'm a family guy, right? I, I love my family. I love my wife to death. I mean, she's my goddess. And But I'll tell you one thing that I think, because it's the most current thing for me, and I don't know if you ever heard of the uh, the meditation TM. And um, there's a website, tm.org. I don't get nothing for saying that. I'm just going to tell you, when I come across things that are profound, I believe in sharing it. And I've taken on the routine. I've always meditated since I'm 14 years old. Because being in the martial arts world, right, you got to be the whole Sun Tzu and, and Zen shit, right? So you got to learn. And the only reason that, that martial art is meditated so we don't kill people, right? So we don't go out there <laughs> brawling and stuff. It's the only reason. You got to be peaceful so you're not deadly, right? And But this TM, I'll tell you one thing that I've done and I've learned. Uh, you know, people listen to this. You can only hear things through the, the level of lenses you're ready to hear. But I used to meditate, but now I'm doing it 20 minutes in the morning, and I do it with my wife now because if you decide to do this TM thing, I believe create everything into an experience. It's changed my life. Um, probably two things changed my life. One, make everything an experience. Your relationship, you go out, it's not a dinner, it's an experience. You hang out with your kids, it's an experience. So I, I hired someone to do private this private training and I'll tell you, it was amazing because it created this family dynamic. And me and my wife, every morning, this morning, 20 minutes, it could be 15 minutes, do this meditation. Now, um, and I think it's really key that everybody listens to this because meditation, most people use to <clears throat> take the stressors and compress it. And really what I learned is meditation is the pulling back the bow, not the letting it relax. It's pulling back the bow. And then letting it go. So it's allowed you, it allows you to get laser. So one thing I do every morning now and around five to seven o'clock, I do 20 minutes of meditation. I'll tell you, anybody who wants to be wealthier beyond belief, the greats have been saying this forever. You know, all the greats, the Steve Jobs, all these people have been talking about meditation. Number two, um, when I wake up, I have instant gratitude. Every morning, I literally train myself. When I wake up, I'm all like, you know, all idiotic because the sheets around my neck. But as soon as I wake up, I smile because I'm like, mother, another day. Like I am to hug my wife and my children one more day to do this one more day. I'm like, boom, I'm powered. I don't sit there and drag my ass. I get the hell out of bed and I stand up and I'm like this. It's a winter. I'm like, boom, here. I Now, normally it's not like I don't look that good like I used to. Right. So it's kind of boom, hair and Hair, I told my son, you know what you got to expect? Hair out your nose, your ears, hair comes everywhere. Italian guys suffer with hair, right? So I'm like, boom. So that's part of my routine. And the other thing is I always have a mantra of something I'm saying that I don't have the same mantra. I just create one. Like, like this morning, I'm like, I'm amazing. I'm great. Change as many lives as possible today, right? And I'll just kind of repeat that a bunch of times. And then I'm like, boom, I go out for my day. The thing that I think, um, and you said it before about patterns and habits, I think this is what people have to understand. You know, to create something new, a, a, something in your body, your DNA results, you have to start off with a pattern. And patterns start good or bad. The pattern is get up and start doing this until it becomes a habit. The problem is where it dies is people create a habit, but if you don't change, shift the habit up, okay, it dies. If I just do the same curl every day, same curl, eventually the muscle don't grow no more. It stops growing. So what people have to know is, don't have the same room routine forever. Do it till it's a habit and then make a conscious decision to shift it slightly. Make sense? Yep. <clears throat> you know, and I, I know that you said when you, you were coming on here that you weren't here to try to sell anything or pitch anything, but, um, you know, we, we do have a lot of uh, entrepreneurs that are listening to the show that do need some of that help, that do want to expand their business mm -hmm. and, you know, expand their system. So, um, I mean, what, what's the best place? If they're looking for a coach and they're watching this like, holy crap. I need to talk to this guy. I need to reach out to this guy. Where is the best place to, to reach you at, Mike? So, I mean, if you go to CEOWarrior.com, CEOWarrior.com, you'll enter into my world. And, and I have some books that I believe uh, help anybody. There's a communication book, leadership book. There's a business mastery, uh, secrets of business mastery book. And I believe those are, are helpful. I think what I would want people to know is, um, and, and I like to be clear with people, is the world that I live in, is I live in the world, and that's why we're called uh, CEO Warrior, is a lot, of, a lot of people watching this, when they were 12, 15, 18 years old, were unstoppable, right? I mean, you probably rode dirt bikes, you know, crashed off skateboards, right? 
you, you would go in a mosh pit, like no fear, no fear. Some of you are old doing that and you're all busted <laughs> up. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you shouldn't do it. But the thing that I think about just thinking if you're going to enter my world, only go there if you're ready to get back to how you felt when you were 18, 18 years old um, with a warrior mindset and, and a fighting level to really change the game, not just for you, for your family, your children, the next 10 generations. But that's the best way to enter my world. Yeah, no, and I, and I love that you brought that up. It's, it's you know, Benjamin Franklin once said that people, the average man dies at 17. We just don't bury him to 75. And it's so sad, man. People lose that that passion, that, that desire. Um, all right, so so let's say um, something happens and you lose everything today. Like everything's wiped out. But I mean, your health's good, your family's good, kids. I mean, all that's great. <clears throat> but you're financially wiped out. But you've retained everything that you've learned through this whole entire journey. What are the first few things you'd go out there on, like a limited to no budget, to go out there and rebuild this massive business? Uh, yeah, and, and, you know, I don't wish that on anybody, but I don't fear it at all. Because yeah. um, when I started the coaching business, which is this is our second and a half year going into it, I wanted to prove something. Now, if you go back two and a half years ago, right, we're in the middle of what they would consider one of the greatest recessions, right, close to the Great Depression. And I think it plays a part. I'm going to share... What I did about that, even though I wasn't broke, I'm going to share it because I believe anybody can start this way. First, I made a conscious decision. Who is it that I want? What is the business I want to have that I'm excited about? Okay? Because if you're not excited about you're going to make money. It's going to die. You're going to get bored with it. Boom, it's going to sink. So one, what is the industry you're excited about? Two, does that industry have money? Can they afford your excitement? If, if you love licking stamps... And you're going to go out there and try coaching or build a business of people licking stamps. They probably don't have a ton of money and there's probably not a lot of them, right? So one, what is the niche I want to talk to? Two, I would identify the avatar of it. Who is the exact person and what is the message I need to go to? Three, what is it I want to offer them? And four, I'm going to tell you one of the biggest things. And I think people make this mistake. Everybody's trying to build everything, right? They're trying to like, oh, I got to build a website and I got to build all this stuff and I got to build an online program and I got to hire a website. No, you got to go on Facebook and say, look, I'm looking to change five people's lives and I have a program. That's it. And I believe people should sell that stuff immediately because that's all I did. Two and a half years ago, I went out there and said, look, I'm looking to change five people's lives. Who's interested? Hit me up. I had a call. I was like, well, oh shit. Now I got to, now I got to figure out what to charge. I'm like, look, it's three grand a month, right? Because I didn't care if I got a no. Because when you don't have any fears of no's, you're willing to take more chances. And from that, we went from, I mean, my, my one high-level program, it's over 36000 a year, which, you know, people jump in. We have 72 people in that program because, one, they understand I'm dedicated to them. And, two, they're going to get results. So let's just rewind real quick. One. Who's the group I want to talk to? Two, do they have money? Three, identify the avatar. Four, make sure I have the message. Five, just go out there and offer it to somebody because the sooner someone says yes, then you could start building it. And I always think of the story. I think, you know, two, two great stories of success. The pet rock. I mean, someone sold a rock, called it a name, and put eyes on it. Can you imagine? And people, I probably bought one for my kids when they were young. Let me buy you a rock. The same damn rock in the backyard, we could have colored with magic marker. Number two is that red paper clip story where the guy, in case you don't know, Google it. A guy takes a red paper clip, paper clip and he wants to prove he could turn that into a million dollars. And someone gets the red paper clip for whatever, a pen, and then the pen for something else. And they keep selling it to the point in one year, 12 months, he made a million dollars off a red paper clip. Yeah, it's amazing, man. Pretty amazing. So, you know, um, I mean, you're, you, you mentioned, <clears throat> I mean, you got kids, you're a family man um, with that. And, and you were building all this while you had kids and, and they're young and, and, and yeah. whatever. And one thing I see so many male entrepreneurs um struggle with and, and, and it's sad, right? They, they, they grow, they grow these epic businesses, but then they don't know their kids. You know I mean? How, how do you, I hate the word balance, but how do you make sure that you're giving your business the attention that it needs to grow, but then also making sure that you don't neglect those important relationships that you're going to regret later down the road? So I think the first uh, thing is to understand there's, uh, people will say, use that word. How do I get life business uh, balance? And I'm like, well, first off, there's, there's no two, uh, two brackets. There's not a, 
life bracket and a business bracket. Business is in life. So one, you have to understand because uh, you have to be congruent. You have to be congruent so you're the same in life as you are in business. When I, I made a big mistake um, in a couple levels. Uh, in my business, when the big business, when I started growing it, I was all, um, I was covering up my tats and I buttoned down shirt, right? And it was like, it's like going to a lion or a dragon and say, let me put a suit and tie on you. It just didn't work for me. I did the same thing when coaching. You thought I would have learned it. And so the thing is, one, you have to be yourself in both of those. Number two, I learned with my wife, it wasn't the amount of time. It was the quality of the time. And it sounds easy said, and people will say, yeah, I hear what you're saying, Mike. But when you're home, there's a difference to being present. You're flipping through the TV, uh-huh, uh-huh, and really just being engaged where everything's off, the electronics. The people today are so addicted to their cell phone thinking that if I don't take that right now, I'll lose it. And I'm going to tell you, if you could challenge that belief and you don't take it right now, that you'll get so much more. Because when you respond so quick, it's like you're slow. It's like you must have nothing to do, no clients. I don't allow people instant gratification or instant access to me. Because what would that say? Like, I am so doing nothing. So I think it's one, um, create some boundaries for yourself, healthy boundaries. Have alignment. Before I chose to grow a business, me and my partner worked together where we met. We both went home and asked our, our I wasn't even married at the time, um, asked our wives, uh, we're going to build a business, but I want to let you know what this could be. It could be crazy. It could be a lot of work. It could be all this stuff. Are you in? And so we made sure we had clarity and alignment with our relationship. And even now that I'm growing, the service company still growing. That will do $40 million by 2020. And the coaching will do $10 million easily by 2020. I make sure I'm constantly taking the pulse of my family. And, and I think it's surveying that's simple. Am I delivering to you what you need me to be as a father, as a leader? Am I delivering it as a husband? And being willing to get accept the truth and then make changes if you, you have to. Because like you said, you know, <clears throat> to die rich and lonely, that's a miserable death. Yep. Yep. So, um, and I know this is a very difficult question to answer because there's so many great uh, pieces of literature out there. Um, but what are, <coughs> excuse me, what are some of the best books that you would recommend to our listeners that had the most profound impact on, on your life and your business? Yeah. So Acres of Diamonds is an old book. It's actually a book that I'm working on a book called uh, Timeless Secrets where I have Acres of Diamonds in it and I'm talking about it. <clears throat> and Acres of Diamonds, to give you a short snapshot, but you should read the book. It's a quick book. It's that, you know, and it's my version of the story. So read the story. But, you know, there's a farmer who goes and leaves his wife to go look for diamonds, right? And <clears throat> travels his whole life looking for diamonds and he dies. And a visitor comes by and sees the wife looking for the guy. And the wife says, no, nah, my, my husband, uh, he died. He was out on a journey looking for diamonds. And as he look, he's looking at a picture on the mantle, he leans on it and he knocks this rock over and it hits and it shatters. And outside the rock comes all these diamonds are in there. And he says, oh, my goodness, he's so sorry I broke your rock. And he goes, where is this rock from? And she goes, the backyard. So the moral of the story is so many people are out there looking for acres of diamonds when they're in your backyard. Profound story. Um, another book that I'm going to tell you, which and these are books I wish I read 25 years ago, right? Um there's a book which may sound weird to you, but it's by Byron Katie, and it's called Loving What Is. I, I mean, profound. Me and my wife went and spent um, three three days, I think it was, with her. Game changer. Just get the book. I won't even explain it. Just get the book. It's, uh, it's profound. And the cool thing is she has an app now that you could do what she calls the work. You just do it. And the app's, uh, the app's a game changer. Besides that, if I was to give you one more book, I mean – Think and Grow Rich is really good, but too many people... Oh, I'll give you the last one. Here we go. Who Moved My Cheese? Number one book that kept me winning through the worst economy that anybody did was I knew the cheese was moving, and the cheese is moving at light speed today. And if you are not... I sit here and ask myself all the time. I ask my partner, my managers... Where do we think the cheese is going to move this year? And you'll have to read the book to understand it. But if you haven't read it or read it recently, 
read it again because it's the number one reason why through the economy, not only I've never had a flat year in my career, I've never had a down year. And through the economy, I made at least an extra million a year in everything I did. It's from that book. Great book. Yeah, it kind of comes back to like Wayne Gretzky said, you know, and they asked, well, how are you so good? He goes, everyone else skates to where the puck is. I skate yeah. to where it's going, you know, and right. um, brilliant, man. So, you know, I know you do a ton of these podcasts, get interviewed all the time. Um, what's like that one question that nobody ever asked that, you're, that you wish they would ask? What's the one question I wish they would ask? You know, it's hard to stump me with a question, but that's a badass question. I'm going to implement that in my shows to stump people now. So the question I wish they would ask is, and, and this is what I think, okay, I got it. Uh, it's funny. I just taught this to my team on a word call yesterday. The question I would ask is if you could rewind time and do anything different based on what you know today, what would that be? That would be my question because really – when you meet an entrepreneur or a successful business owner, when you ask them if you could rewind time, what's the one thing you would do different? They're telling you the magic of what you should never uh, do. So that's the question. Yep. So what, what would your answer to that question be for you? Yeah, I knew that one was coming. <laughs> I, I made sure I was ready for that be, before I said that, that question. Here's what I would have did. I would have found things that challenged my limiting beliefs. And so, for example, like, Firewalking has challenged my limiting beliefs. Um, I think it's a good example. Maybe some people can relate to it. And now it's very common for me to burn a fire in my backyard, rake it into 1,200 degree hot coals. And my daughter walked across it when she was seven years old, my son when he was 10. And we'll just do that at a, at a picnic. I'll burn a fire and we'll just walk on it. The reason I would have challenged it a lot sooner was when you see how how powerful you are as a human, you make very different decisions. And so I wish I would have researched and challenged those limiting beliefs with hardcore exercises that make you think very, very different. That's what I would have done. That's amazing. I love it, man. So, you know, um, I created this podcast because I was sick and tired of all the information out there by these quote unquote gurus that have never done it, you know, and I'm like, let's create a space where we go out there and interview the doers, guys like yourself that have created epic businesses, epic lives in the trenches, overcome adversity. Um, and with that being said, you know, our, our listeners are listening to the show because they want to create the same thing. You know, yeah. so what, do you have any last pieces of inspiration or advice that you would give them so they can go out there and create an epic business and a life like you've been able to do so for yourself? Yeah, I'm, like, I'm writing it down so I, I get it in order and I'm going to let you know. And this is the same thing that if you called up my kids today and you asked them what are the three key key things to do. And the cool thing is my son's actually uh, building a business called Teen Warrior where he's going to take teenagers and help them with this warrior mindset young. So that they because so many people, it's pathetic. They get out of college and they're hoping to figure this, figure life out. They're 25 years old. I'm like, you're late. Here's what I'm going to tell you. One, the sooner you understand you're in the business of one thing and one thing only, and I heard Dan Kennedy who's one of the brilliant minds of this. Um, I think Joe Polish probably said to another brilliant mind, I would understand the one rule. Um, you're only in the business of one thing, marketing. Yep. Uh, number two on top of the marketing thing, which I think adds to that, is a guy, Dean Jackson, what he says, uh, another friend of mine, he says everything's marketing and marketing's everything. And all these people, you ask them, what business? You're all in life changers and I'm in this. and I No, 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 brother. You're in the business of marketing. That's first and foremost. Without marketing, you can't get people. Number two, I would tell you, and I'm going to use the word sales. You're in the business of sales, but I'm going to tell you, I don't use sales in my company at all. If you came in here and said the word selling, I'll probably punch you in the face. We use the word serving. You were born to serve, and when you serve at a higher level, and there's probably deeper understanding than even the time on this, this uh, show to do it, but when you understand how you were born to serve and you serve with the right education to help people make decisions, they, they buy all the time. And like I said, we sold $180 million last 10 years. The last thing I'll tell you, which is you don't have this, you can't build a big business, it's leadership. And leadership, people are like, oh, I get it. Be a strong leader, like my dad told me. I'm like, no, look. There's leadership in communication. There's leadership in training, leadership in managing, leadership in coaching. Leadership has many levels. You may be good at one and suck at the other. A lot of people are bad leaders of their family. That's why the dynamics are struggling in families today is because the husband is not a warrior and a leader that's saying, bring me the storm, right? So if you look at that, marketing, sales, and leadership or serving and leadership, 
Those three things will change the game for anybody on the planet that wants to build. And I live in three worlds, wealth, freedom, and market domination. And you don't have to want all three. I love market domination. I love to go into market, punch it in the face and say, look at me what I did. Now I'm going to show you how to do it. I love wealth because I change people live with it every day. I love not having to be worried about that money. And I love freedom. And I'll never go for double wealth if it pulls from my freedom. Wow. Amazing, man. Powerful words. And, and to our listener base, I know we end every podcast with this, but information without implementation is just the start of delusion, right? Information is not power. It's taking that information, implementing it into your life that creates power in your world. So you guys, I mean, you had so much great advice from Mike today, so many gold nuggets. Make sure that you take something that he shared with you today and start implementing. I know Mike talked a lot about that implementation today. So in that, you can go out there and create that epic life for yourselves. And Mike, man, this has been a massive honor. I know you're a busy man. Um, greatly appreciate and honor you taking time out of your day. I mean, it's been amazing, dude. Really appreciate it. Thanks, man. Appreciate being out there. Go get tattoos, everyone. <laughs> All right, you guys. We will uh, talk to you next time. See you next time.